So, uh, my brother's not here. Really? Yeah, he's uh, actually coming back from D.C., so, like, he can come in at any moment. Okay. If there's any interruption and stuff, like, that's what's going on. Like, okay. I, I probably should not be raided by the police, so it'll probably be him. Probably should not be. Okay. Should I be concerned about you, Andrew? No. Uh, okay. It's, it's just a little scuffle with the police. N- nothing to be concerned about. This is Control Structure, episode 131, for July 22nd, 2017. Big month to everyone listening. This show has notes. Visit thenexus.tv slash cs131 to see them. I am your host, Andrew Bailey, and with me today is the other host, Stephen Orvis. Hi, Andrew. Hi, Steve. So the 131, we're getting up pretty high. Yeah, um, we're kind of behind, but I don't know, eat my shorts. So, uh, anyways, so, you know how I built that really, oh, hey, I'm doing a podcast right now. So, remember how I built that really fancy computer? Yes. So, um, I decided, hey, let's go encrypt it. So, uh, that, if you recall, I also did a BIOS update. Uh huh. I do remember that. So after that, I'm like, "Hey, let's uh, let's do uh, encryption everywhere." So I did that, and my machine started crashing, like every two to four hours or so. Could be very annoying. Yes, uh, especially when it's encrypting the drives. So like, I was really concerned that uh, whoops, your drive wasn't encrypted before it crashed. So. Windows isn't going to start up anymore. Mm-hmm. Uh, but fortunately, that did not happen. So uh, I think, you know, because I wanted to do everything on my hard drive, I think it crashed maybe about 10 times before it got through the four terabytes. So uh, then after that, I'm like, okay, well, it's finished, but it was still crashing. It was crashing whether I was playing Fallout 4, it was crashing whether I was watching YouTube videos. And, like, I think it even crashed once when I was reading mail. Like, you know, I couldn't find any kind of particular uh, pattern to it. So I'm like, okay, this really sucks. So then I started eliminating a few variables. And uh, I pretty much put uh, Ubuntu on a thumb drive and, you know, did a live boot from that. And pretty much let it, you know, run on YouTube all (laughs) night. And it... You know, came back exactly where I had it, so it didn't crash while I was watching YouTube all night. So, so Ubuntu is good and Windows is bad. Correct. Okay, just check. So, but that was like after a few other variables that I did. Uh, so, I went ahead and uh, you know cleaned out my Windows install that I had for like a month or two, uh, but uh, it was still crashing. So I'm like, what gives? So, uh, at that point, uh, I'm like, okay, well, the next thing would be, uh, roll back the BIOS update. But, unfortunately, uh, Asus did not have the previous beta BIOS, uh, up, but it had the one from before that, the original, uh, BIOS that the board came with. So, I couldn't really overclock my RAM, but, like, at least, hopefully, I would be, I would be stable. And that's kind of done it, but I've, but now the crashes seem to be every twenty hours or so. Hmm. So, uh, yeah, it it crashed twice, and then I'm like, okay, well, I don't know, maybe the power supply is bad. So, I swapped out for the old one, and it was running okay. Uh, but then, like, I heard a noise, so I immediately turned it off. I'm like, okay. So I turned it back on, then my uh, uh, UPS started freaking out. I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, it was just running fine. And, like, I tried to turn it on, like, five times. But, uh, you know, it was still freaking out. And eventually, I saw a huge flash at the back of my computer. Oh, no. And I'm like... (gasps) So, uh, like, as I was uh, taking that 
the old power supply out and putting the new one back in, I um, smelled something, if you know what I mean. Uh, but that nice smell of burning uh, electronics. Yeah, that one. Uh, so uh, nervously, I pressed the power button, and thankfully, I didn't fry anything. So I think it's crashed like maybe once since then, and uh, like up until I don't know, like three hours ago, I had uh, a memory test running like for like seventeen hours or so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mem test plus like was running for like 17 hours did like six passes and didn't find anything so, so you're, th you're thinking that it was just that the power supply was was not right then well or somehow it's it it's, it's back it's back to the original one where it was crashing all the time oh, okay so it's not the power supply it's not the cpu it's not the ram uh and it's probably i'm thinking that it might be a storage device because anytime i run oh. things that's like not windows it'll be fine okay so it's like what it's reading from and yeah, yeah that that could make you crash if someone turns your brain off um no it 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 you might crash if someone takes all the papers and stuff that you've been working on takes those away but uh yeah uh that's my adventure and hopefully we won't crash recording this podcast <laughs> yeah hopefully yeah uh, maybe you should have done it in you bunny too <laughs> Well, I I don't know of any kind of recording facilities for Skype in Ubuntu. Yeah, that's true. The Skype app's pretty bad in Ubuntu, so I actually use the, the I, handy I, dandy Chrome. I think they actually discontinued that. That would explain why it looked like it came from the nineties. Um, no, that was other things. I think they discontinued because it looked like it was from the nineties. Ah, I see. Ah, uh, so uh, between all the crashing. Uh, we haven't had any podcasts for a bit, so now that I've finished with my open world RPGs, I can play and finish more games faster, and I can write uh, more blog posts about games because I'm actually playing and finishing more games. So uh, my latest as of yet is uh, Bioshock Infinite, uh, which is uh, another in a string of disappointing not RPGs, but at least this one ends kind of well. Uh, so, uh, I haven't, uh, let's see, it's, I haven't been to an Olive Garden in a long time. Uh, have you? I don't know that I've ever been to an Olive Garden, so. So, uh, there's a guy that goes around to Olive Garden to essentially review, like, little permutations of dishes, it seems okay. like. And, uh, he was recently targeted, uh, by what appears to be a robot that misunderstood the purpose of his website and uh, demanded uh, him take down his entire site uh, because he was using the trademark Olive Garden uh, without authorization. And he uh, writes a pretty hilarious letter back t uh, to the email address sent th that sent this, uh, which is uh, Brand Enforcements, uh, which... Uh, uh, the guy refers to as Brandon Forcements. Brandon, okay. That that was a pretty good play on words there. Yeah. I, I didn't catch it the first time why he was named Brandon. <laughs> Mr. Forcements. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I call you Brandon. Raspberry? 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 Raspberry! Okay. Have you ever not not to quite as loud, because it's because like family people would be like, "What are you screaming about?" <laughs> exactly. Yes, and your brother would be like, "Do you want raspberries?" <laughs> okay. Yeah, he's he's kind of chilled out on the couch. Okay. Uh, so, anyways, did you ever want to be a pirate? Uh, not really. But then again, I've kind of been a pirate for a while. Well, if you want to have your own pirate radio station. Apparently that's as easy as using your Raspberry Pi and uh, attaching an antenna to one of the GPIO pins and there is a handy dandy, handy dandy image that uh, uh, someone has made up that has a media player that will go ahead and play uh, the Raspberry, on the Raspberry Pi or play on FM radio for you so you can tune in and 
claims to work for like a whole fo fo football stadium's worth of distance away. Hmm. So it's actually a quite powerful uh, FM transmitter, not like these uh, cheap ones I you get. I think we might have had something like this on the show, but yeah. Possibly, but I'm blessed with the poor memory, so these things are exciting to me time after time <laughs> after time. So yeah, even though it'll go down to one megahertz, uh, aka 1000 kilohertz, which would be the range of AM. AM is not FM. So it so, won't exactly work down that low. Um, I was thinking back, the one you're referencing, I think we, I do remember it now. I want to say it was more of a short range yeah. one. I do remember actually doing it now that you say that. I, I remember using it. Yeah, so, yes. I think I think I tried it out for like, a, a, like maybe a, for a few minutes, but I couldn't exactly get it to run. Yeah, I remember that yours wouldn't run, but I want to say mine did run. I forget what all uh, what all it was. It probably was a different project, but yeah. Anyways, probably. like I said, blessed with a poor memory, so it was exciting <laughs> for me to read about. Uh, so, anyways, while you're out being a pirate, uh, maybe you're away from home for a long time, and your poor cat is getting hungry. Uh, I bet you, when you're out and about, it makes it hard to feed your ha cat. Hi, Andrew. Um, yeah, that's yeah. why I don't have a cat. Exactly. So, <laughs> anyways, uh, there... That turned made... a little dark. <laughs> a little dark. So, uh, this guy made an automatic cat feeder, and it actually dispenses two different types of cat food. And it's just got, like, this big uh, tube, and his pie apparently meters out so much cat food a day, so then the cat doesn't eat too much cat food. Then suicide because he ate all of his cat food at the beginning of the week and didn't save any cat food for the end of the week because no one told him when you're coming home. So now you can get a cat, Andrew. Well, yeah, but then I'd have to concern myself uh, with food coming out of the other end. And this is always a problem. That's true. I've heard it's been a while since I've seen it. Or, I say that or, it... or even in the rare case, the food comes out of the same end. Yeah, that's even... Yeah. Anyways, <laughs> both of them are bad. <laughs> so yeah. yeah, the last cat I had, the food would frequently come out of the same end. <laughs> that that's not not nasty, not very pleasant at all. So uh, we ha do have some raspberry heresy too. Uh, <gasps> yes, I know this. This is this is horrible. Someone's trying to be better than the Raspberry Pi. Currently, Gigabyte made what kind of looks like a mini motherboard uh except for it says it's uh let's see here twice the size of raspberry pi so it says it's 146 by 102 millimeters uh so it's smaller than most of your small form factor motherboards but it looks a lot like a motherboard it's got a processor uh celeron i believe yeah uh, soldered celeron, on. yeah n3350 but uh, the neat thing is though you can stick in your own ram so it's got a ddr3 slot and then it has the m sata which i want to say that's what you had on your your board right andrew the uh, M SSD port? Uh, not really. Not really. Okay. But it's it's kind of similar though. Uh, yeah, it's just essentially it's just a little slot on the motherboard. Uh, M SATA uses the SATA protocol and is like limited to six hundred megabits. Okay, so maybe it's a bit slower, but still. Uh, rather, uh, and the M dot two can do either SATA or PCIe. So probably beats, I'm thinking, whatever the Raspberry Pi has for that SD card reader. Oh, definitely. Might be a USB device under mm -hmm. the hood, possibly. So that seems to be a big plus. It's got USB 3.0 ports on it. Uh, Which is a here. nice. Yes, exactly. Because where, you're where probably are those, carrying are those gigabit Ethernet? Those gigabit yeah, Ethernet. dual gigabit oh, Ethernet ports. Dual. It's got two of them. I didn't even notice that, too. That's super neat. So this is set up to be like a server or something. Like, yeah fun if you wanted to move lots of data fast so i wonder um, how this stacks up compared to the tinker board uh i would think this would be a little faster because it has the celeron in it uh, whereas i think the tinker board still has an arm chip on it okay so even just having uh not being arm is kind of nice because then that opens up what kind of software you can run and how standardized it is uh -huh. as something with the pi i was actually or actually with the chip rather in this case I was uh, thinking about trying to set up a VPN server on it, but currently I needed to load some module into the kernel to support uh, the routing I needed, and really? it was going to be a lot more painful than uh, than it would have been just on a normal normal server. 
So, like, he couldn't just set up a poor man uh, socks server? Uh, there may have been other options. I didn't really look into other ones. I mean, just yet. I mean socks comes free with open SSH, so. Yeah, there, there probably will, could be other ways. The one I was looking at, they were doing some uh, magic there with the firewalls and stuff that they were, the way they were setting up. That was kind of the area where I ended up uh, missing stuff. So I kind of got sidetracked researching that part and I never really read on the rest of the tutorial. So, yeah, there might be other options. I'll have to look into that as I go. So, thinking about making my garage door into my VPN server since it's on all the time. Just as long as there's good separation there between the door and the internet. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyways, perhaps when you're plugging in the garage door, you're running out of USB plugs on your Pi. So, uh, with the USB IP, you can uh, plug in a USB device or... on your desktop. Or, or any place. Or okay. rather, USB over IP. USB over IP, thank you. Uh, you can plug it into your desktop or someplace and then connect it magically over the network and it appears as a USB device on the other end. So you can plug in like a keyboard I was reading or what have you and it just like slides underneath and from the operating system's perspective, it's literally sitting right there. So your drivers and everything work uh, with it right out of the box. So that was pretty neat. I, ran across that. Uh, lots of times when I'm playing with a Pi, I don't really want to unplug my desktop uh, keyboard and stuff, and that's just annoying. So I can see how that could be super nice to be able to do something like that. Yeah, I uh, I remember uh, reading about when this was uh, released on uh, the Linux kernel support for this. It's a, it's a neat concept. Definitely. So, perhaps uh, you're one of the people that likes to use uh, CDs. And yeah. despite the fact that uh, a lot of people use MP3s or Flack or Hack or, or whatever, whatever all things you use. Uh, hey, I like still... what I use. Oh, that, that, that's okay. Everyone has preferences. Uh, maybe maybe you still like your CDs. So uh, it's you know kind of manual process to pick up CDs one by one and uh, load them in your CD player. Uh, perhaps you'd like a Raspberry Pi controlled robot to do that for you. Yeah, uh, I see it, this. Yes, it's pretty neat. It, uh, I guess it's got some 3D printed parts in it, and it's got two stacks, one on either side of the drive, and it just kind of like turns, picks up a disc, it drops in the drive, and uh, you know moves it to the other side when it's done. The thing I would see with that is you'd almost need a way to index like where it stuffs them, so then if it was trying to find a certain disc, it would know to just move through the stack until it found it. I was thinking what could be super nice if you're burning like a lot of discs of something, you could use that for loading the blank ones in. Or if you were just like ripping a bunch of CDs, that could be super nice too. Because uh, it could just sit there and churn and do its thing and rip a bunch of CDs for you or something. Yeah, so whenever I've needed to like rip a bat, like rip an entire batch or just an entire collection of things, what I do mm -hmm. is I get like every DVD drive in the house and stick them into one machine. Which, uh, let's see, I think... I think last time I did it, there was four. I think I might have actually went over to my mom and dad's place because oh, I wanted to. Uh, yeah, I wanted to uh, like rip all of their CDs. Mm -hmm. So like I pretty much put in like the four drives, you know, mounted them in the case, and I uh, I actually had to look around for like some software that would actually let you uh, rip from multiple drives at once. Uh, but I eventually found it. That would that would be good for just like a handful of discs. I yeah. probably not many people actually have a 500 disc spindle that they need to rip. But if you did that, would be so, this could be kind of neat. Yeah. Um, let's see, I think I must have ripped like maybe 50 CDs or so that way. Yeah. So and doing four at a time, that's pretty not too bad. Yeah, because like essentially, when one disc, you know, was done, another disc would be done. Like mm -hmm. after you like, you know. Take the take the disc out, put a new one in, put it in, start it. There'd be another one finished. And I've also uh, ripped a whole bunch of DVDs that way as well. It's kind of cool. Yeah, it makes it nicer if you have a bunch to do. If you have that extra drive to plug in, that's uh, a good solution to do it that way. Have you heard, ever heard of Computer Craft? Computer Craft. Uh, I don't watch TV. Of course, you've heard of Minecraft, though, right? Well, yeah. Hey, I I, I was gonna go with just Stanley Parable as the next step. 
Like, if you said no, like, I don't watch TV, like, Stanley and Marable. Uh, anyways, so computer crafting. Stanley my... went and planted cucumbers. Yes, Stanley planted cucumbers. Anyways, in computer craft, uh, there's many things you can do. Uh, it, it lets you have computers, and one of the things I believe is in the computer craft mod, uh, there's a mining robot, which is basically a computer that can move throughout the world and do things, place blocks, take blocks, hit things, stuff like that. And a lot of people will build gardens and stuff that the robots manage and uh, pick stuff for you. Uh, and uh, so that's a way of automating these gardening tasks. So uh, someone did, though, uh, some Raspberry Craft. They used the Raspberry Pi, and uh, they have a facility. It's actually a business where they grow cucumbers, and they need to grade the cucumbers uh, based on like the prickliness and things like that. Uh, so they do it by hand, or did do it by hand, but now they went ahead and used... Google has this... Uh, uh, on their cloud platform, I guess the machine learning algorithm that they were able to plug into, they fed it a bunch of pictures. I want to say, was it 900? 909,000. Let me look up that really fast. Uh, I was looking at the sample size they 7, fed 000. it. 7,000. 7,000. Yeah, I knew it was pretty big. So 7,000 of those cucumbers, pictures of it, and they said that it was 95% accurate Uh in grading the cucumbers then coming through. But I think if they turned the learning on, then they said it only was 70% accurate because like the real world stats was, it was starting to mess its data up uh-huh. as it was trying to learn. But anyways, that was pretty neat that they uh, could grade it. And that's a task you figure, if, you know, someone's sitting there grading them, that's going to be a pretty boring job to do. If you can automate that and fairly cheaply with the pie and maybe a little bit of hardware stuff, that could be a big deal for a small business. I thought those are really cool use oh, of yeah. the pies, real life use of the pie. Uh, I've been uh, different times. I thought like the Pi really has a great application for industrial use to build little small machines that just do simple tasks that take a person time that could be really expensive to replace with a robot. If you could build something simple with the Pi, replace that job. Oh, now yes? you know, sort of you know, poking through this more. That is cloud robotics, man. It is cloud robotics, which is pretty cool. I want to look up. Later on about the yeah, Google that's... Cloud and how he did it, because that sounded really cool. Yeah, that's that's my uh, uh, favorite pie in the sky kind of thing. <laughs> it oh. is the pie in the sky. Oh gosh. That okay. that, that was that was a epic dad joke. I I, I, I think we now have uh, <laughs> another French title to choose from Pie in the Sky. Okay. What's next? Hi. Did you ever want to be an astronaut when you were a kid, Andrew? Uh, at some point, yeah. At some point. Well, if uh, you'd had uh, this guy's uh, guy's dad, you could have had a, a Raspberry Pi controlled Apollo spaceship simulator where Ooh. you can sit in the spaceship, flip switches, hear rocket engine sounds happen, uh, pull up in a control panel and have pipes and hoses and things, and even control a robotic arm that comes out and deploys a satellite uh, using buttons and switches and cameras and things and stuff. So rather rather complex looking uh, simulator. I guess his brother has a desk that folds up and is like a mission control desk that's controlled. I want to say that one's a Drino, but it does different sounds and things. And it's modeled after the Apollo 11s. So if you do the the CO2 flush, they actually like go through the sequence of blowing up the ship and stuff and <laughs> play like the audio sounds and video files from that event. Uh, so anyways, someone who put. Tremendous amounts of time into toys that kids could play with, but you know what? Those kids might be super interested in super interested in space someday, so maybe they uh, find their early training useful. Mm-hmm. Have you ever thought about having a solar server? You know, at some point, I think I mentioned it uh, that uh, you know, I, uh, I think it was like one of the first Kickstarters that uh, you know had the solar panel and got the uh, what was it the battery bank mm-hmm. uh, and yes. then. And then I was epically disappointed because the battery bank can only do one thing at a time. It can only charge or charge something else. It can't do both at the same time. I do remember that now that you said that. Again, I was blessed with a poor memory, but then I, it came back to me. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, uh, so solar server. Uh, someone did something like that where they hooked up solar panel, battery, and things like that. Uh, it's not really hardware-wise that impressive. Just what was kind of neat was that they did it, and I thought about it at different times before. I just seen the pieces they put together, and then 
kind of the icing on the cake. They actually, at the bottom there, they have a link to their uh, web server, and I see it's been up for nine days, 17 hours, 28 minutes, and 51 seconds. So I thought that was kind of neat. I was a little disappointed, though. I was hoping to see, like, the battery status on the web server page someplace. I was hoping to see that. But uh, unless I'm missing it here. Let's see, auto refresh, add-ons. And not seeing, not seeing really a page here for the battery. That would be kind of neat to see the battery. Has the uptime. Nope, I don't see battery. But anyways, yeah, I thought that was kind of neat. Uh, I still would like to do, uh, use a Raspberry Pi Zero, so it would be, I, I suppose it might be a little bit harder. Uh, still would be fun to do one someday, I think. So, um, have you ever used Windows, and have you been annoyed by menus going to the left? No. So, uh, at work, uh, my laptop uh, would do that, uh, and I began to poke around at that, you know, because, you know, obviously menus flying out to the left is not traditional uh, Windows UI behavior. I just thought it was just a quirk of Windows 10. Uh, but then I think I, you know, noticed that uh, my desktop here at home, the menus go to the right. And I'm like, what's up with that? So I figured out it's because the touch screen is set to right hand mode. And then I'm like, oh, yeah, my laptop at work is actually a touchscreen. So uh, wow. Windows uh, was set to the uh, majority of people being uh, right-handed, uh, which is, uh, I guess, would be an incorrect assumption for myself, but I don't even use the touchscreen. <laughs> so I set it to uh, left-hand mode, not because I'm left-handed. <laughs> it's because I want the menus to behave properly. To like actually look, you know, kind of like old school Windows, you know? Yeah, like old school Windows. I think my new catchphrase is going to be "I don't use Windows 10." <laughs> what you you didn't know it was loaded? <laughs> oh yeah, that too. <laughs> uh, well, hey, I guess uh, Windows isn't exactly old school anymore, and I didn't know that the Windows Store was loaded with Ubuntu now. Currently, and since I don't use Windows 10, uh, I can't install Ubuntu from the Windows Store because I am using Ubuntu. And I really don't have any interest because I just want to use my virtual machine because if I have to reinstall Windows again, I can just transfer over the virtual machine and poof, got everything. So ironically, neither of us have tried Ubuntu from the Windows Store. <laughs> Uh, but it's it's a thing that exists. I do, I do see its value, though. I was talking pre-show. There's some uh, just like Docker images, things like that. Sometimes installing software. Uh, Ruby is one thing that just comes to mind. It can be incredibly painful on Windows. And so I can see how having this shell built in could be kind of neat to have. So, hey, speaking about Ubuntu, uh, remember Dustin Kirkland? Is that the guy that was asking about... Uh, I, it looks like the Ubuntu that was asking about the software. Um, that on, uh... So, yeah, he, he was the Ubuntu guy, that uh, uh, Ubuntu project manager, rather, that uh, hit uh, Hacker News for, uh, uh, like, suggestions for Ubuntu. You know, mm -hmm. little things that, uh, you know, you encounter every day, but you don't really know how to put it into a bug report or anything. You just got to live with it. Uh, so he's he's back again, and he wants to know what the default apps should be in the next release of Ubuntu. So I'm basically, it feels like to me the apps that come don't really change too much. If I want something, I just install it. So it's almost like a more lightweight app is just as well as anything. Yeah, but uh, so you know, let's let's go over this. If you had to provide each one of these, like you know, web browser Firefox, obviously, which I'm pretty sure already comes with Firefox, uh, and by Firefox I mean Ubuntu. It already comes with Ubuntu, right? Does Ubuntu come with Firefox? Is that the question? Yeah. Uh, let me think about that one. I want to say it would. Yeah, because I think I saw it on the uh, like the live USB stick that I uh, popped in. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it doesn't come with Chrome. Chromium, I want to say I installed a separate PPA yeah. for, so I'm thinking Firefox is probably what it was. They used to package, didn't they used to package some weird browser 
It was like their own branded one that they decommissioned. Uh, uh, Debian used that ice weasel thing. Ah, I think that's what I'm thinking of. Yeah. So let's see. Email client, uh, I guess Thunderbird, which I think is also the default. Uh, terminal, I really don't care. Just give me bash. Uh, let's see. I, let's see. I think IDE, like no one's really, uh, uh, how should I say, come to a decision on that. Because, you know, pretty much everyone has their own different IDE that they like. Oh, as far as default IDE to install? Yeah. And then, yeah. and then let's see, Office Suite, LibreOffice, that's kind of obvious. But, uh, you know, I guess all of these are kind of uh, irrelevant because if you actually want to strip down installation, you use the, uh, the mini ISO that you choose what to download uh, to begin with. See, to me... A lot of the software, by the time you uh, install it and download the image file, you get around to uh, installing it, it's going to be out of date if you need to update it anyways. So you're not really saving that much download time. Well, Maybe a if, little bit. if you have the like the actual install disk, you actually have it right there. But so, if it's out of date and it's going to download it. Yeah, so you'd be downloading it anyway, but like... De- saying it that you download it twice i mean well if if you're the one who actually downloaded the iso and burned it oh, okay so you're, you're going on the assumption that some people might not have downloaded and burnt the image file yeah fair back in the days when uh internet was scarce and i was on dial-up and you downloading things from the library so that i could have library office or actually that time open office yeah in the library i would have appreciated uh things pre-bundled because i knew that downloading was hard and scarce and not easy to get anything. Bandwidth was nights. scarce. Bandwidth was scarce. So, uh, I've been somewhat intrigued by random terrain generation, like going back several years. But I've always been disappointed about how Perlin noise makes unnatural landscapes. So, like with Perlin noise, you'll have like a mountain somewhere, and then kind of like smooth down and then like oh there might be a mountain over here but like each one's kind of isolated so Mm -hmm. unless you're trying to go for islands perlin noise is not exactly that great so because like natural land forms like there's like an entire range of mountains and like it kind of looks kind of jagged and raggedy and stuff and then like next to it you might have like a flat plain going on for a while uh but uh and then, like, there'd be, uh, you know, the natural biomes and stuff would, uh, you know, just be there and be natural. But, uh, like, generated landscapes, like, from a pure algorithmic percep- perspective, at least the cheap ones, seem kind of fake, uh, at least to me. Would but, you say Minecraft's probably one of the cheap ones because it just kind of picks, uh, picks yeah, different so- biomes and sticks them in the world as you run through? Yeah, I I actually, before I, you know even thought or said anything about this like i looked it up and apparently minecraft uses perlin noise uh-huh. uh but uh since the rest of minecraft sort of looks uh unnatural well i guess it kind of fits they can get away with it yeah i mean like you're holding a chicken and you throw the egg and then bam a chicken comes flying out wasn't that handy yeah that's like totally real yeah and I, I feed my horses uh, hay all the time so that they can make more babies. <laughs> so uh, I've I've always wondered how a landscape modeled on a bunch of fluid simulation would work. So like I pretty much put a comment out there, and one of the responses I got back was this. Uh, apparently, someone actually has you know done a like a bunch of plate tectonics and uh, like moisture and weather simulation. <laughs> and uh, actually came up with something really cool looking. He uh, actually implemented it in uh, JavaScript so you can have like a live demonstration of it. Which is really neat to be able to scroll around and see the different parts of it. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it calculates, uh, you know, like the plate tectonics. So, like in other words, like continental, continental drift. And, uh, you know, then it calculates, you know, the stresses on the plate boundaries and like if it happens over land you got uh, a mountain range if it happens in water you got a chain of islands and then uh like it models by latitude of how much heat uh gets put in 
and like whether like if it's over an ocean tile you got a lot of evaporation going on then it blows over land and then you got a rainforest and uh like if you have uh uh let's see like you know the mid latitudes you got some deserts uh like and then you got the rain shadow you got deserts there you might have some grasslands like exactly what i was thinking about you know mm -hmm. so like uh at first this guy was thinking he's like okay well how should i like tile everything cuz like this needs to be a sphere if it needs to be a planet right so typically that's that's a, a way to do it so yeah, he has this huge blog post, and then oh, you actually have a live demonstration of it. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. So yeah, definitely, a, definitely something to toy around with. I killed all the people on my planet. It's all brown now. Like this, <laughs> the Earth, or like the sun got too close and just yeah. <laughs> killed all the grass. Yeah, like you can like rotate it around and stuff. Mm -hmm. So like I, I was thinking about this because uh, Star Citizen. Uh, has been recently showing off their procedural planetary technology out of their uh, 3.0 release. So, like they uh, like have a neat uh, uh, you know video there about how like the different layers of the rendering comes together, and then just like shows it zooming out. So uh, let's see. I guess this doesn't exactly apply to you. Do you have a website that uses uh, HTTP? Uh, yes, but I don't have a SSH access, fortunately. Uh, okay. Uh, well, apparently if you don't have HTTPS, uh, your life is going to become a little more miserable. Yay, people will be angry at me because the search box isn't encrypted. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, like, I happened to come across this, like, a day or two before, uh, like I had like some issue come up at work where HTTP and HTTPS URLs were duplicated. So uh, like there was some uh, uh, like there was like some discussion of it was like, well, just take the HTTPS out of there. And I'm like, really? I don't think we want to be doing this right now. Mm -hmm. So I put that onto the ticket and I haven't heard anything back. Interesting. <laughs> and that was like a week ago. So, uh, do you have a lot of script kiddies uh, scanning said site? Well, uh, try to bomb them. So, uh, this is, uh, uh, how should I say, uh, what is called a, a decompression bomb, which essentially someone encodes like a whole uh, bunch of a blank uh, file or a blank image, and then the client, in this case usually a browser, would download the file and just blindly start to decode it and allocate all of the memory in the system, causing something to crash. It's interesting is how the different browsers, how they dealt with it. Like I did it in Chromium, and I think I got it to like six gigs, we said, until it uh, went ahead and it just killed the process. And said, okay, you're just doing something that's not good. Yeah. You know, like IE crashes and burns. Uh, this here. It says Edge. Memory rises, then dips, then loads forever. What's Edge? I'm trying to think what browser that is. Is that the new one? Yeah, that's like, the uh, Internet the Explorer successor. Yeah. Oh wow! So like they're they're shipping the line like just doesn't deal with it. Nice. <laughs> so I don't know what Nikito is. Uh, is Nikito. Safari. Yeah. High memory usage crashes and reloads. <laughs> it's another one that commits suicide then comes back to the life only to die again. Yeah. Okay. Chrome, I haven't tried it in Firefox, and I don't want to crash my Firefox. So I have, yeah, like, a lot of tabs up, so. Yeah, the uh, the guy doesn't say anything about Firefox. Yeah, that'd be interesting to try. So, uh, like, the only downside is that, uh, like, the normal uh, compression method, uh, gzip, can only do a 1,000 to 1 compression. So if you want to use up, like, 16 gigabytes of this guy's RAM you'll need to send 16 gigabytes of a response, which uh, might not exactly be the most efficient. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, this is this intrigues me, and I so want to implement this. It's an interesting idea, because it's kind of a way to fight back against uh, like so, scanners and things and stuff. Yeah, so uh, did I... Oh, did I crash your irresponsibly rampant vulnerability scanning? <laughs> 
<laughs> no, I don't run PHP here. Get out. So, like, if I was thinking that, uh, like, I have a, uh, uh, let's see, a uh, honeypot uh, system mm -hmm. where, like, this IP is definitely bad and anything that comes out of it, don't listen to it. So I'm thinking, it's like, well, if you're in there, then you're definitely on my hit list. So, yeah, I'm going to do nasty things to you. Go ahead and send him a bomb. Yes. That's a good idea. And and I love it how at the very top of this, I'm on some list now that I have written an article about some kind of bomb, right? <laughs> so, uh, AMD Threadripper CPUs have been detailed. Uh, 12 cores for $800 and 16 for 1000 so these are your server server level cores, I'm assuming. Uh, this this is like more of the uh, was it the high end desktop processors. Okay. So it kind of seems in line with the uh, the Ryzen uh, line uh, because there's eight cores for well now less than five hundred dollars and sixteen for a thousand that well seems about right. So how's this comparing with Intel's equivalent then? Uh, so. Let's see, I think this uh, this article comes up here. So the i9-7900X is a 10-core for $1,000. Okay. So, so uh, you can get your 16 cores instead, so six more cores, yep. same price. So, Not bad. Yeah, this, of course, this is probably before any kind of you know price drops. So, And also uh, Epic launched the, uh, the server-grade CPUs. So with which, uh, how should I say, most of them uh, are like far more expensive, and I <laughs> believe you need two CPUs for a lot of them, because like only oh, they're just made to work in a pair. Yeah, uh, uh, only a few of them uh, are are supposed to be uh, was a single uh, socket. Hmm, interesting. Yeah. So you got your Epic twenty four core workstation. So you head off to do some epic multi-threading. You launch a build of, say, Chromium, and you want to do something else while you're at it, and you go and move your mouse, and you can't d move it to do said anything else. WTF? Well, it turns out that on Windows, process creation and destruction is single-threaded. <laughs> so if you have thousands of processes to use your 48 CPU threads clamoring to start and terminate, there will be slowdowns. Uh, so Thank this you, Windows, I don't use Windows 10. So uh, apparently he goes back and reproduces this on Windows 8, but Windows 7 totally does not have this bug. Hmm. Interesting. So he uh, like goes into a debugger and uh, says that there are 5,768 context switches where NT GDI close process was on the ready thread stack, each one representing a time when a critical region was released. The threads readied on those call stacks have been waiting a combined total of 63 seconds. Not, oh. not bad for 1.125 seconds in real time. Uh, and if each one of those readying events had been happened after uh, had been held the lock uh, for 200 microseconds, then the events would be enough to account for the 1.125 second delay. Hmm. So he pretty much amps it all up and, uh, you know, looks at process graphs and stuff and can uh, essentially replicate this every time. So Windows has some uh, work to do then. So, in fact, adding more cores to my workstation makes the UI less responsive. That is because Chrome's build system is smart enough to spawn more processes if you have more cores which means that there are more terminating processes <laughs> fighting over the global lock. So it's not just 24 CPU and I can't move my mouse, it's 24 core CPU, therefore I can't move my mouse. So uh, let's talk about bl Backblaze for a moment. So uh, the uh, cloud backup provider, those guys, that re uh, releases uh, useful stats on hard drive deaths. They've noticed that uh, hard drive prices aren't going down as fast as they used to. So uh, have have you noticed this at all? Um, a bit, because I'm kind of still waiting for the terabyte SSDs to get in the $100 range to buy one for my laptop. And they're still a bit high. I mean, I haven't actively looked for them lately, but I've, I have noticed 
that they aren't going down as fast. But on the flip side, I guess I haven't really cared because I still haven't filled up like my terabyte or two terabyte external hard drive I have plus another hard drive. So I guess right. I haven't cared too much that they haven't gone down much lately. So I want to say that they're fairly close, but maybe I thought it was uh, maybe two hundred dollars instead of one hundred. I was saying I'm waiting for it to go to a hundred because it hasn't gone down yet. Oh, or you're saying it's getting closer? Is that what yeah. You're saying? Oh, okay. So uh, let's see a spot check. No, they're still like two hundred sixty. Maybe Black Friday. Maybe we'll see. Yeah. Let's see, sort by lowest price. Maybe I just get a new laptop uh, in a couple of years instead. Yeah. Because mine's from a few years ago, and it was like a low-end one at the time. Plus, it was that Lenovo one, and we remember what Lenovo did. Yeah. You don't want to do that again. Mm. So, yeah, it looks like the lowest one is uh, two two sixty. Okay. So, so uh, trivia question. How much was... Uh, Hard drive prices per gigabyte in 1981. Um, if I recall from the article, like half a million dollars. Correct. How much is it today? Uh, less than five cents. Ah, close. Three cents per gigabyte. Well, that's less than five cents. It, it is. It's just kind of a vague answer. It's a very crisp answer. <laughs> Trump America! <laughs> or however he responds to that. I'm trying to interpret their graphs or kind of getting a feel for their trends. There's yeah. still an overall trend of going down, though. Yeah. so It's, it's you, slower. There we go. The last, from maybe, say, 2014 onwards, that's where it gets slow. Yeah. Ever since that flood. So, yeah, you can see the flood causing prices to go up late 2011. Yep. Like you can see the dip in the three terabyte, then whoops, nope. <laughs> So it's interesting, they almost went back to the same trend line it had before in 2013, and then it just stopped. So what happened right there in 2013 that that sharp downward trend stopped? I think that was like when they uh, moved past four terabyte drives. Hmm. So So we're we're hitting a point where normal everyday people don't really care about a six terabyte because they still haven't filled the four. Maybe, but like it also might be like more of a like a physical boundary, like uh like aerial densities on the platter can't exactly increase as fast, so you'll need to have more uh, platters on the disc. Mm, that's true. That would kind of make sense. So, because like again, I only have uh, four terabyte drives, uh, like the largest capacity that I have, which uh, uh, Backblaze also takes note that. If you go above four terabytes, then the price per gig starts to go up again. Mm, so I think your theory is a, a, a pretty fairly found you one. All right, tracking flights. So uh, the project was kind of interesting, but more so what he, how he did it. I heard it before of it. Uh, this guy made a project where he can plug in an antenna and then gather data and track these flights of airplanes and stuff from off the radio. Anyways, how he did it was interesting. He used actually a a Docker image to go ahead and run and compile and run the software. Uh, So just to make it easy to install the Pi. I've heard of doing such things before. I never actually saw the real example. Uh, Kind of interesting to me because I've been playing with Docker at work lately and just seeing how easy Docker is to kind of get a consistent environment. I'm seeing that could have a lot of potential for this IoT stuff with the Raspberry Pis. If you get in the mode of just uh, deploying your Docker image out there, and then it makes it easy to test it out in other places and configure it and get it just right, and then you spend less time monkeying around in the in the command line playing with the the Pi instead. You can have it there before you send it out. I thought that was kind of a neat use of Docker. Yeah. I think I think the neater part is that you're you can see like where planes are. Yeah, that that is neat too. That that was the kind of the first thing that attracted me. That was like, oh wow, you can like kind of track the track the airplanes and stuff. So you can do your own own thing. What's that nice about that guy is he actually found that there's been different forks of the project and uh, the code project that did it. And so he's abstracted all that stuff for you when he's stuck in the Docker computer. He's making those choices as to which project to pull and what to do and he's uh, just make it easy for you to install 
Cool. So if you'd like to uh, send feedback to the show, you can do so at thenexus.tv, uh, especially if you're looking right on our show notes page. And don't forget that uh, today is International Backup Awareness Day, so back up all your flight plans. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. How's uh, things going with you? Uh, Lisa? Things are going okay. So... Uh- so uh, as as for myself, uh, like the the oppressive heat of uh, the dog days of summer have finally kicked in. So Not it's biking. like yeah, it's like ninety degrees every single day. So at least like biking later in the day is out of the question. So like if uh, it's it's clear if it's clear on like Saturday mornings, go then. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, other than that, don't don't bother. Yeah, it's it's good to get out and exercise, but you know when it's when it's that hot out, it can be yeah, it's just annoying. Mm-hmm. I do really love the Camelback stuff and being outside when it's super hot out to uh, bike riding or something, because that's for me. If I have enough water, I can go, and that that does it. So uh, I looked closer at my bike, and it actually has a second mount for a water bottle. Really nice. Yeah, that's a pretty good feature. So, but uh, at least, at least for me on my standard trips, you know, like a second bottle is not needed. You just need a water fountain, like wherever I'm going or going past or whatever. That's true. You ride in kind of different places than I ride, so uh, you have <laughs> more options there. Yeah, makes it really nice. So, uh, let's see. Aside from that, uh, well. Uh, I will be in Kansas City uh, coming up. Uh, that, that would explain the, the change of podcast date. Yeah. Um, like, the scheduling just kind of wouldn't work out. Like, I'd be here, but it would be busy. Mm-hmm. It actually worked that good for me because uh, I, I'm probably not driving down down to the office this next week, so that uh, actually worked that good. Yeah. Plus, it's summer, so, like, do whatever. I don't care. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so uh yeah i guess that's it for now so have a good one you too I'm not sure if you clapped over yourself. I clapped over myself? I mean, yeah, me you, saying I beat you? Yeah, you might have uh, clapped over yourself in your eagerness. <laughs> you gotta be first, Ben. <laughs>